Robinhood Radio and the Robinhood Radio Network is proud to present Leonard Lopate at Large, lively hour-long in-depth discussions providing overviews and context to topics usually covered in partial measures. His guests include leading thinkers, scientists, artists, economists, farmers, historians, authors, and politicians. Mr. Lopate is a Peabody Award winner whose numerous honors include three Associated Press Awards and three James Beard Awards. <laughs> Welcome to Leonard Lopate at Large. I'm Leonard Lopate. Emmett Pelled is a virtuoso cellist, recording artist, orchestra conductor, and a music professor at the Peabody Institute at Johns Hopkins University. One of his goals, it seems, is to make classical music more accessible, so he's published a children's book called A Cello Named Pablo and The First Hour, a new cello technique method book. Tim Smith of the Baltimore Sun wrote of a recent performance that, quote, Pellet did a lot of joking in remarks to the audience. His amiable and inviting personality is exactly the type everyone says we will need more of in classical, if classical music is to survive. He joins us now to talk about all of that, about Bach, basketball, and about performing on Pablo Casal's 1733 Matteo Gafrilla cello, cello, and I'm very pleased to welcome him to our show. Hi. Great to be here. Thanks. You have brought your cello with you because you'll be performing some music for us this afternoon, but this isn't the Casal's cello. No, the Casals cello is now uh, with uh, Mrs. Casals in Washington. It needs to rest a little bit uh, because we just finished the recording, and uh, a cello like a human being needs a little really? bit, a little bit of a rest, uh, maybe from me, but uh, <laughs> it needs uh, some uh, oxygen before we embark on the the rest of the season. <laughs> well, prior to receiving the Casals cello, didn't you play a 1689 Andrea Guarneri cello? Yes, I did. I, I was very, I've been very fortunate uh, with instruments. Of course, none of us musicians can afford those. But um, a, a lady from Cape Cod who is an amateur cellist um, invested in a Guarneri and, and handed it to me basically mm -hmm. to play. Um, the only down part of that cello, it was a beautiful cello that it was uh, too small for me. I'm 6'5 and uh, the cello was really tiny. So I got tired of people after concert asking me, are you too big or <laughs> the cello is too small? Yeah, and somebody, somebody said you it. enveloped your yeah. cello in one of the reviews. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and now you, but you haven't brought that either. You have a <laughs> third cello here. How different are each, each or is each instrument? Well, they're very different. Each one um, allows you to bring out your own voice. It's not their voice, but they allow you to do it in a different way. And, of course, one needs to find a cello that fits to them in order to find their voice. And I find that the three cellos that I've been playing with, the Guarneri, the Casal cello, and the Thomas Dodd, which I have here uh, today, are three instruments that allow me to find my own voice if I'm just nice to them and I don't disturb them. And, and the, the this cello is also not a brand new one. Why are centuries-old uh, string instruments so highly prized? Don't we know how to make really good ones today? Um, well, we'll know about that in 300 years. <laughs> um, there, there are very Is it good. The wood that mellows. Or? It's well, it's the seams of the wood that moves with the uh, uh, overtones, and the more, the older it is, and the more flexible it is. Um, the more the scenes react to the playing and then it gets more vibration and thus gets a better quality and warmth of sound. So if you are planning to play a certain piece, would you say, oh, this one would go best with the Guarneri or the Casals or the... Probably, Dow? probably. But I cannot travel since I buy tickets for the cellos. I cannot <laughs> travel with three of them. <laughs> there will be four plane tickets every concert, so I, I only travel with one. Uh, Pablo Casals used uh, that cello to record the box suites in 1936 and don't you have a recording of of those pieces scheduled to be released in february yeah so that's what i said in the beginning of the show um, i just recorded the first part of it the first three suites on the cello that casals recorded his recording which became legendary we all know it we all grew up on it i did myself in a tiny kibbutz in israel that's what i used to listen to when i was 10 years old and um, the fact that i was able 
I was allowed by Mrs. Casals and the Casals Foundation to embark on such a journey to record the suites is uh, nothing short of a dream come true for and, me. And the first time the suites are being yeah. recorded using that cello again. Yeah. You've noted that Casals had nothing in his ear as a model when he began recording the suites, but when you started, you had his recordings plus those of 50 other <laughs> at least great yeah. cellists who've recorded them since. Is it possible now to find something new in a piece of music that is so well known? Um, I wouldn't call it new, but what I tried to at least, what I'm trying with every recording, especially with the Bach, was to be honest and sincere. To, to bring out what I think is my own take, my own voice about it. And it was not so easy because of the, the subconscious uh, knowledge we have in our heart and soul about uh, those recordings. So it you wanted to sound like Casals? No, I didn't want to, but um, it's natural that you will somehow co uh, copy or your subconscious will copy from those great recordings. I really tried not to, and I found that uh, I needed time. I needed time to get away. I stopped listening to recordings for a long while since I got the cello, and I, I went through a journey. I really like to call it a journey, a personal journey of getting away from everything I knew about it and trying to sound as fresh as possible. Yeah, you, you got it in 2014, and you say it took you even a couple of years to find your own voice yeah. on it. How much do you think of yourself as continuing the legacy of Pablo Casals? Well, this you have to ask the, the audience and the students, but I know for sure that uh, Mrs. Casals, Marta Casals, is to mean, she told me when she handed me the cello, she said, there are two things I want you to, to do with the cello. One is to share the legacy with the people around the world so they know, because unfortunately even conservatory students don't know about who Casals was, some of them. So part of shame it was... Shame on them. Shame on them. Um, part of it was to make sure that these people know not only how great he was as a cellist, as a humanitarian, as a musician, as a conductor. So that's one part. But the other part, which was very interesting, I did not get it when she said it. She said, I want you to go out there and find your own voice through that cello. And uh, I was a little bit shocked when she said it because I thought, wow, I, I'm the lucky one to get this cello, which means maybe I remind you of Casals. No, 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 no. <laughs> maybe the one thing she saw in me or heard in me was um, originality. And she thought this kind of sincere honesty and originality, I would like you to develop it and to find it to the full extent before you have to give it back to me. Well, I always wonder about that, the originality aspect. Uh, people criticize Glenn Gould for playing fast and loose <laughs> with some of the things he played, but you have uh, a score to follow. How original can you be if you're doing what the composer asks you to do? Well, this is a very interesting point, of course. A lot of jazz players who just improvise always ask us, you know, what do you really show in the music. I mean, it's not you. There's nothing about you there, which is really not true. Uh, if you would ask a great actor that recites Shakespeare, you know, this is not you. It's all written. Mm -hmm. No, it's written. Yeah, you have a master who wrote a text, but it's your interpretation of the text. So I always tell my students, there are three things that are not negotiable, sort of, and it's the quality of the sound that you produce. You don't want anybody to say, oh, this is ugly. It's the intonation the heights of the notes, and it's also the sense of pulse. But sense of pulse is something very big. Like one of my teachers and, and now colleague, the great Leon Fleischer, Leon Fleischer, the pianist, mm -hmm. who just celebrated 90 years old these days, um, he says, playing music is like a free walk on a firm ground. And I think this is so true. The ground is firm, the pulse, the rhythm is there, but you need to walk freely on top of it. How freely you walk on it, it's up to you. Now, you're the, vi the, the recordings that are about to be released are, are uh, listed as Volume 1, th just three of the suites. How many pieces did for the cello did Bach compose? Well, he did six. He composed six. Oh, so there'll be a Volume 2? Yeah. And the reason why I separated them is because um, I'm just now in my early 40s, and I really feel, you know, you don't make CDs today because the public need it. Mm. They don't need it. As we said, there are at least 50, if not more. You People make don't even buy CDs No, they anymore. don't buy it. They download it, but why would they download even your CD? Mm -hmm. or why wouldn't they even listen on, on Pandora or all that to you and not to your, your mind to other people? Mm. Um, so you really make the recording as a statement for your own good. 
it's it's something that you want to to recognize in many years maybe this is how i was back then so for me to record the bus suites i don't need to just sit in front of microphone and play all six of them and say oh i did it mm -hmm. i would like to to do it when my heart and soul is ready and the first three ones are much more innocent and young in approach you can call it uh, early bach whereas the last three are more like late bach so if i would compare it to real life if you're 17 and you're in love, you look forward to life and you're in love. If you're 85 and you are still in love, you look back at life and you tell your grandchildren, this is how I met grandma, you know, mm -hmm. this is back then. So I feel now musically more like 17. I look forward and I want to record the second volume. It, it will happen soon, but I want to have the experience of looking back and say, now I can look back on playing Bach and not look forward on playing Bach. Although I'm sure you've been playing the, the last three a I've lot in concert. Um, now, Bach was a, a keyboardist. Uh, why do you think he composed so many things for cello? Well, he composed the six suites um, mainly for cello, but he composed for strings uh, so much. And, you know, with Bach, we don't know how he did it and why he did it. He composed a cantata every week. And uh, <laughs> somebody said they did a research that just to copy his music will take more than his whole lifetime. Just to copy it, not to write so it. He so he wrote really fast. He was really, I mean, you have to imagine that composers these days, you have to sign a contract and to pay them so much money. And then you play it once, maybe twice, maybe if they're really good, five times. When Bach was uh, assigned to, to, the, to the church in Leipzig, he had to write every week a cantata that some composers today would never ever in their lifetime write. Not only the cantata, he would have to write it the middle of the week, give the parts to the players, work with the players, see where to make uh, corrections, and then perform it on a Sunday. Not to mention all the other pieces that he wrote, not because he had to, because he wanted to. He it's, must it's, have had a favorite cellist in Le Leipzig, or a favorite well, we violinist don't, as we well. We don't really know. That's the problem. We don't really know. Those suites until Casals were sort of um, exercises that some cellists played, but many didn't. And I, I want to get to that in a moment, but uh, uh, many people have suggested that of all the instruments, the sound of the cello comes closest to the human voice. Uh, do you think that uh, that's true? And uh, do you think that might have uh, appealed to Bach? I'm sure he did. Because he wrote so much for the human I'm, voice as well. I'm, I'm sure he did. Uh, it, it does for me, for sure. The, the cello has this low notes, this low voice, and then the high notes, and what everything that in the middle. And, uh, you know, now being a father, for instance, having three kids and a wife and life, you can really hear all the people in your life mm -hmm. <laughs> in a cello where a violin would be as gorgeous and, and warm, but would be representing maybe just your kids and not, not the lower, not your grandpa. So it, it really, it represents everything. And, and also the way we sit with the cello, we hug the cello all the time. It's between our legs and we hug it. It's a very human posture to be in all day long and I think it does something to the sound that you produce you don't produce it out to the world you produce it within you mm -hmm. my guest is Emmett Pellad uh, who is a virtuoso cellist and uh, this is London Lopez at large on WBAI New York 99.5 FM you are going to play some things for us uh, live in the studio here what do you have what are we going to start with well uh, this is the first time I sit with a cello practically under the microphone, but <laughs> this is always a fun experience, so we'll go for it. Um, well, Carnegie I, Hall is across the street. It's across, you, you so if I play well, I might get across the street. Yeah. <laughs> you have played it, Carnegie. I did, I did, yeah. So um, I thought to start with the prelude of the first suite, which is really like birth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I want to combine it um, with a piece by Bloch, because both composers are very close to me. Ernst Bloch. Uh, Ernst Bloch. Uh, and it's called From Jewish Life. So, you I you, And you recorded. Uh, I recorded that too. Mm -hmm. And um, what I will group first is the prelude of the first suite, which is the beginning of all beginnings, uh, with a Jewish song called Supplication by Bloch. And uh, it's sort of like a mirror looking at the same emotion of birth and beginning, one from uh, probably the greatest composer of all time, sort of like the Bible that we have, and another one from a composer who looked at it uh, through his life, through his lifetime also. This was around the First World War um, and the devastation that happened in the world. And he came up with this uh, identity, Jewish identity and Jewish themes. So here are the prelude from the first suite and the supplication by Ernst Bloch. Thank you. 
Emmett Pelled playing live on Leonard Lopit at Large on WBAI 99.5 FM in New York, uh, opening with uh, the prelude to uh, Bach's Suite Number no. 1 in G Major, and then following that with uh, s- uh, something by Ernst. by Bloch. Now, um, before uh, Casals began performing Bach suites in, in public concerts, weren't they regarded almost exclusively as pedagogical, uh, pedagogical, pedagogical, right? Pieces yeah, they were for basically teaching? exercises that teachers would assign students to learn so they can learn how to play the cello. Well, the, the, open, the opening of, of that uh, that first piece is one of the most famous uh, musical compositions. Uh, people yeah. who don't know anything about classical music will recognize it. Exactly. And it's extremely beautiful. So with how, were people missing something for centuries? Exactly. Well, you know, until Mendelssohn's time, Bach uh, was sort of forgotten by, by the public. Mendelssohn sort of reinvented Bach by performing Mm-hmm. Bach again as a, the conductor of the Leipzig Gewandhaus, he would take Bach pieces and perform them because Bach was this something this Bible like that m- just musicians sometimes attend in the living room just to discuss and to try out for themselves, but not in the public. And then Mendelssohn came, and of course after that it was like an ocean. But Casals, just to understand the magnitude of how great he was, to see the emotions behind those simple black dots on the no- on on the piece of paper there are no uh, dynamic signs there are no articulation signs boings uh, are not his so we don't really know what the exact boings that he wrote because anna magdalena copied his uh, manuscript we don't have the manuscript so it's very sort of vague what what was his um, emotional intention and yet anybody who plays them it's so emotional and so um, uh, introspective Bach had gone out of fashion because uh, because romantic music had taken over, and then Casals found the romantic in Bach. Exactly. Uh, but th- th- are they simple enough that that they are something that students can learn how to play cello on? Oh, that they are horrendously difficult. <laughs> That's in, what in it many, sounds like in to many me. Way, uh, ways, and I think the hardest thing about them is to find your own voice and sincerity and honesty within them. It's not easy to do because you just see a group of notes and you play and you try to sound like somebody else, but what are you trying to say with it? It's not easy. One of my great teachers, Aldo Parisot, who just passed away last week at the uh, age of 100, he used to tell us uh, that he had, an, uh, he had sort of a dream to go to a um, deserted island somewhere in the world to find 10 um, people who were you know, we're just born on that island and have no idea what cello is, mm. what classical music is, and uh, of course what Bach is. To spend a few years with them and to teach them all the Bach suites. And he, his point was, he said, I am sure that the most talented person without hearing one recording of Bach would sound so musical and so right playing that music. Well, in, in the case of Gasals, he's kind of discovering something. You've also recorded Nadja Boulanger's Three Pieces for Cello and Piano. Uh, was it unknown until you did that? Well, it was known, I guess, in the cello cult <laughs> world. Because she's remembered as a great teacher, yeah. but uh, did she so compose much? She she did, and I was really fortunate and honored to be on a, on a two-CD set that was actually nominated for a Grammy last year um, of all her chamber music. Uh, including the pieces for cello, including songs, including pieces for organ. She was a very uh, good and very emotional composer. However, her sister was more known as a composer, and she, her fault was that she was really known as a teacher. Um, well, she taught some of the most important yeah, musicians and, and, and so on. Copeland, but Copeland, cetera. and she was also a great conductor. So she was the first woman to conduct the New York Philharmonic, the Philadelphia Orchestra, the Pittsburgh Orchestra, the Boston Symphony. Uh, and yet, the, at the uh, beginning of the century, when she was asked if women should vote, she said, no, we don't have the political sophistication. Whoa. But at the same time, she was the most feminist and, and outgoing. So that conflict in her is really evident in her music. And I, I'm really um, honored to be on that CD. And those three pieces are so beautiful. And, of course, I've assigned them now to students uh, ever since I recorded them. 
you you have performed in concert halls all over the world, including Carnegie here, but also for your concert debut at Alice Tully Hall, you played the Hindemith Cello Concerto. You have also performed the Shostakovich Concerto, uh, Penderecki's Second mm-hmm. Cello uh, Concerto, uh, with the composer conducting, I, I gather. Yeah. Uh, uh, in this current era of serial music, minimalism, and electronic music, is there much new music for cello being added to the repertoire? Yeah, well, first of all, the, the Penderecki pieces for cello, his greatest pieces he wrote in the 80s of last century. Mm-hmm. Uh, it seems like a long time ago. Um, but uh, definitely there are great pieces. We, we have had... We well, were the lucky. last century wasn't all that long ago. Yeah, we, we were lucky. Uh, the world was lucky to have Rostropovich among us uh, mm-hmm. until recently, until about 10 years ago. And he commissioned hundreds and hundreds of pieces, including the Penderecki, Concerros, uh, Shostakovich, uh, Lutoslavsky, Dutier, Britain, and so, so many great, great pieces. So as cellists, we, we were really lucky because we had sort of a Paganini among us that um, were, was a friend and was able and was curious enough to ask his friends, his composer friends, to, to write for him. So it was um, really evolving all the time around him and we now the generation my generation we're so lucky because there's perspective already on on the pieces that were written for him um, and, and, and he in the same way that Casals set a certain standard with the Bach on all those other pieces Casal set a, su- a standard that cello is a solo instrument uh, bringing it to the force of the stage and not just to play a bass line with a quartet or in an orchestra was something quite new and Casals was the first one to really do it and make a living out of it. Then after him came Fournier, uh, Feuermann, and of course Rostropovich later on, and it really opened the door to make the cello known as a solo instrument. Then came the composers who heard the cellist playing it, and they, they just saw that it's possible to write solo. It's a little bit what is happening these days to viola. The viola is now having this renaissance and uh, really uh, a new life because viola is becoming really better and better and composers see that and write to them. So most of the repertoire is, is uh, modern music. So vi- viola pretty much was an ensemble instrument. Uh, exactly. In, in chamber music, the vi- violin, the viola, the, uh, the cello, and the, and the bass. Yeah, and, and I think the bass will be next. Uh-huh. In 100 years, probably bass players will, will sound, you know, they'll play cello pieces and they'll sound as good as cellists. And um, piano and violin have had their, <laughs> their up. Now it's a sort of, a, it's a cruise control. <laughs> But the greatest players of violin, I think they're, they're well, of course, Perlman and Zuckerman are, are two of them. But if you think of, of great violin players, they're from the past more than from the present. And uh, when you think of cello, yes, it's a past, but it's really uh, evolving. And viola is definitely something that is happening. We are talking about uh, music and uh, we have uh, the, the great honor of having one of the uh, the, f- the finest cellists uh, Thank in you. the world uh, right now with us, uh, Emmett Pellard. Uh, and um, I'm going to ask you to play something else. Is that okay? Sure, definitely. Okay. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's is going to be more Bach, or are we going to hear something else? Well, I think I'll play, before I play Bach, I'll play uh, another piece that is close to me by a uh, composer that I'm quite sure was never heard on this radio station by Joachim Stuchewski. Stuchewski was, uh, again, a Jewish composer, but mostly a great cellist who lived in Europe and um, had to flee Europe in the Second World War. And he had two options, one to go to the U.S., or the other one was to go to what was then Palestine. And he ended up in Palestine, in Tel Aviv, which was back then just sort of sand, just desert. And you can imagine this man arrived with a suit beautiful suit, a, a really Western European educated cellist arriving in, in the desert and seeing camels and, and <laughs> asking if so what the hell is going on here? I'm, I'm more German than, than Jewish in a way. Um, and it happened to many of them. And he, instead of choosing the route of either leaving Palestine or becoming depressed about it, he decided to embrace it and to write music that is affected by his uh, Hasidic roots, Western European roots and education, and Mediterranean flair to it. 
So, so before you play, just let me tell the audience that they're listening to WBAI in New York, 99.5 FM. And I'm going to play um, a Latvian song. A Latvian song. Uh, he was born in Latvia, and this song represents his childhood. Joachim Stuchewski. Okay, well, a little Bach now? A little Bach, yeah. How about the Saraband from the oh. first suite? Uh, I'd if you love feel it. like it, there's no room here, but if you feel like it, you <laughs> can stand up and dance. <laughs> Saraband is a Spanish dance, <laughs> and it's a dance where the second beat is um, emphasized. Um, it's mistakenly uh, thought to be a slow dance. It's, not, it's an intimate dance. How would Bach have known about it? About the Saraband? Yeah. Because, well, that's a good question. Bach wrote in Italian style, in English style, English mm -hmm. suite, in French style. He never left Germany. And he didn't have a CD or um, mm -hmm. internet. He was a genius. Mm. Um, he would hear something and absorb the style and write in it. So this is a, a Spanish dance, and it was banned by Bach's time to dance it because it was too intimate. <laughs> the man and the woman actually touched each other, and that was not allowed. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
It still stuns me that something so profound could have been a student piece for years. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, that's uh, the Sarabande from... From the third suite, actually, not the first. Now, is it one of your goals during concerts to, to break down the barrier between performers and the public as a way of making classical music more accessible to a wider audience? Um, you, you use explanations, you tell jokes, you even throw in a basketball game challenge? Well, yes. Well, all I'm trying to do is to explain to the public through an evening, through a show, that yes, we are musicians and what we do is deliver a text that somebody else wrote, but we are also behind it, uh, stands or sit uh, humans. And these humans are the same and the one that sits in the audience. You know, we have, I have kids, I have a wife, I have life, uh, we have mortgage, we have stuff to do. This all comes out through the music that we play. And I think it's important for the public to understand it just by two or three minutes um, explanation before each piece that I play and sort of to connect the music that we play to our daily life through who we are. So if you say jokes, m maybe I, I can be sometimes funny. Sometimes I can be emotional or political or uh, I, I, I really try to be myself. And I think public, when they see that, that's exactly the barrier. That, that, that's the problem we have with classical music. You, you wear a suit, you're quiet, the audience is quiet, and then you fall asleep. Your wife <laughs> kick you to wake up after a long day of work. It's not entertainment anymore. And it used to be. Are you concerned that the audience for classical music tends to be getting older and older? Well, I am, but then if I read a review from the last century, you know, beginning of last century, the reviewers are concerned about it as well. Wow. Because, I, because I was, uh, and I'm sure many others of my age, was introduced to classical music by my parents, and you get the feeling that it doesn't happen as much anymore. Because You're right. the parents today grew up in the rock and roll era. You're right. However, as a, now talking as a professor, we get more and more applications to music schools um, knowing that it's very hard to make a living out of music at the same time these people come from all over the world and and they want to study music and become musicians this is it's really amazing for me to to think about it so yes you're right parents are not putting it at home to listen to um, even my kids uh, even though it's in the house all the time they resist it in a way even though they have to play but uh, I think there's also an appreciation today by high-tech business um, uh, people um, to what art and what classical music can do to you, to your brain, to your skills as a businessman. So we have hope, I think. Well, I remember being at the, uh, the ballet and uh, the person sitting next to me said, my parents have season tickets and they keep on trying to get me to... No, it wasn't the ballet, it was an opera. Uh, they keep on trying to get me to come and I keep on resisting and this is so great <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> come from now on but much has been made in the press about how you had to choose between playing basketball and playing music uh, didn't you grow up in in rural Israel how advanced was your basketball career when you made that choice well yes I grew up in rural Israel I grew up in a kibbutz it's a social community small community um, there we were six kids in a class that's it and a lot of attention, and I'm very thankful for it because education-wise, uh, when, I, when I came to fourth grade, I had to pick a musical instrument. And I, pick, I picked the cello, well, because of a girl who played cello, but I did pick the cello, and that's a good part of it. But at the same time, I was so much into basketball. I loved it. I practiced it. I was even more ambitious than I am as a cellist. And for a few years, until I was 15, I did both. Mm -hmm. And I did both, apparently very well and then were you six five now now i'm six five were you one of the tall kids even then well no and that was a problem that's why i'm a cellist today because <laughs> when i had to make a decision my cello teacher said look you're practicing four hours a day now you have uh, training every day you have uh, games every weekend you really have to make a choice you can't keep up with the, the two of them and i couldn't i remember going to high school waking up at 5 a.m to practice 90 minutes exercises and scales then going, coming home, doing homework, going to training, and then coming back home, doing another two and a half hours cello. I was really dead. <laughs> so I had to make a decision. And I remember myself sitting in a room, in my room, in my parents' house, and, and deciding to go with a cello because I, I tell, told myself, well, there's no way I'll be a basketball player. I'm not tall enough. And now I'm 6'5". Getting back to the whole business of age, 
When you joined the faculty of the Peabody Institute, weren't you the youngest professor at a top musical institution? I was, but you know, life, <laughs> you go on, you, you get older. Yes, I was very young. I was in my 20s. Wow. And I even had a student that was older than me <laughs> when I came in. I remember the, uh, when I came the first day in Johns Hopkins, um, we had to get a photo ID. And there were two lines. There were lines for, I will never forget it, for faculty and for students. And I stood in the faculty line. But the guard there said, no, 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 no. You have to go in that line. <laughs> I said, no, but I'm a teacher here. Well, he wanted to see my ID for that. But I said, I don't have one yet. <laughs> so I had to get an ID. So I started very young, but it never felt young to me. Teaching is a, a very um, organic part of what I do and have been doing. So, so I, I feel fortunate that John Sopin gave me that opportunity. Um, and I, I've enjoyed it ever since. Do people respond differently to classical music in other parts of the world? Because you've performed in the United States, Europe, Middle East, Asia. Are they, are they similar? The audience is similar everywhere? Well, I can say that uh, the silence part of it, yes. If you, when you make music, um, and, and I felt it even now we, where people don't see it, they just hear us, but we sit in a room of the three of us, and I could really sense and feel the silence when I played. Uh, I could feel the, the two of you breathing, your producer and you. Did and you want me to cough or something? No, no, thank, thank God you didn't. <laughs> but I could, there's an energy. There's a dialogue of energy between the audience and, and, and the performer. And that part is not different because we're all human. However, the reaction afterwards is very different. I, I would say that I was most impressed and most touched by the reaction in Russia. And you've taught in Russia, haven't you? Yeah. And uh, I, I think culture there is so appreciated. People, be, when you play a concert at uh, uh, St. Petersburg or Moscow Conservatory, Grand Hall, there is a stand of flowers outside, and people buy flowers, not knowing you, buying flowers because afterwards, if they would like the concert, they want to give you flowers to appreciate what you've done. Uh, that's amazing. Nobody runs to the parking lot to get <laughs> their, the car first. They stay and they want encores. However, to play in Israel for me is still um, the more scariest because uh, I just, it's home. And uh, I know people, I, gr I've, I grew up there, and there's something very special about playing to people that know you since day one. Now, uh, we've mentioned that you're, you've been a soloist, uh, but how much of your performance is d being done within chamber groups? I know you've, you have, uh, you're a member of the, uh, the Goldstein, Pellet, uh, Fitterstein Trio, the, the, also the Tempest Trio. Uh, you, the, the Tempest's Dvorak recording has been described by Fanfare Magazine as the best Dumsky Dumkey. Uh, Dumkey, I'm sorry, Dumkey <laughs> on disc ever. <laughs> you, you've also played with the Peabody Chamber Orchestra, led by Maestra Marin Alsop, and established a cello orchestra called the Peabody Pellet Cello Gang, also <laughs> the Mount Vernon Virtuosi. Well, yeah, you can. Well, I tell you. Are you spreading really yourself thin there? <laughs> my belief is that a musician is, uh, is sort of a Renaissance artist. You have to do everything that allows you to express music to the public. Uh, often students, not ask me, but they announce, they come to the lesson and announce, I want to be an orchestra player. I want to be a soloist. I want to be a chamber musician. I want to be a teacher. And I always have to tell them, it doesn't really matter what you want to be. What you need to be is a great musician and a great cellist. Life will find its way for you to, to do one of them, or two of them, or in my case, all of them. <laughs> but I, I really think music is music. It doesn't matter. Some people say, well, that soloist doesn't really listen. They only play loud and they think about themselves. Well, they don't really, they're not musicians. So when you mention all those things that I do, what I do is make music. And I make music with my students in the Peabody Pellet Cello Gang. In fact, that's what we're going to do next week in Florida. And um, I, I conduct an orchestra, the Mount Vernon Virtuosi, and I play solo with orchestra, and I play with my two trios, and I love each one of them. We recently did a program with members of Orpheus. Uh, their group works without a conductor. As a conductor yourself and someone who's worked with some of the world's top conductors, what do you see as the advantages and disadvantage, disadvantages of each approach? Well, it, it's all possible. The good thing about an uh, Orpheus, of course, it's one of the best chamber orchestras in the world. I mean, the musicians in it are so good. And basically what they do, they listen. And what a conductor needs to do is to show the way. The conductor doesn't play the instrument. So I love the combination of being able to conduct 
and sort of be a, a musical policeman <laughs> for yeah. a group of people and also being a cellist where I can feel and create the sound myself. So I, I think that Orpheus can do it without conductor. They can also play with conductor if they like the conductor. The good thing about not having a conductor is that everybody has to listen because if you don't listen, <laughs> it just falls apart. Uh, and that's what happens with the chamber group. Yeah, well, exactly. So I've heard orchestras play better than five without a conductor. It's possible, but maybe it could be more a, a performance of one idea when you have a conductor that leads the, the group. But it's all possible as long as people are listening. Recently, I did a, a concert talk to businessmen. Uh, I went to a actually health insurance company. They have 6,000 workers. And I, I met with the 500 um, um, CEOs of each department. And what I try to explain to them is that the best lesson of democracy is music. Because in music, the first thing you do, you have to listen. And in democracy, you know, it's not about, it's about having a different opinion. But if you don't listen to the other opinion, you can never be convinced. So music can really teach. And what I try to teach these CEOs is that you make the decision, of course, but the cleaning person in your, in your department can have an opinion and you might want to listen to it. No, you've traveled all over the world and that can be an adventure sometimes in ways that you don't expect. Something happened to you when you did the Penderecki in Poland. Yeah, well, I didn't expect that to be such big news, but when I uh, played the concerto um, end of November in, in Wa Warsaw in Poland, I had a flight back home to the U.S. Uh, starting the trip at 4.30 a.m., and as I was approaching the, the security check, the lady there, who was probably very upset about working at that time of the day, um, told me after the cello, because I always buy a ticket for it, and my, my bag with strings passed through security, she said, well, take out your strings. So obviously she knew what it is. And then she said, uh, you cannot take it on board, the strings, your cello strings, because you might strangle somebody with it. <laughs> and I, I was just shocked because I fly at least once a week and all my colleagues, that never happened before. I mistakenly started arguing. I said, well, you know, with my Israeli chutzpah, I said, I can take my belt and strangle somebody. I can take my phone cord and, and do it. And she said, well, stop, because I'll take that too. <laughs> she was not joking. And just before asking me to take the cello out and take the strings off the cello, um, I just left uh, there. And uh, she took all my strings and threw them away. I took a video of it. And I was so upset and, and appalled to it that I wrote um, sort of a, a funny email to Norman Lebrecht, who, who runs a sort of a gossip website of classical music. And by the time I landed in the state, that thing was all over <laughs> the news, all over the world. So I guess uh, people take strings now and, and are not afraid <laughs> because what happened, because now airports know about it and they, they <laughs> let you go on board. Well, you don't look that dangerous to me. <laughs> uh, we don't have a lot of time left, maybe five minutes or so. Can you play something else for us? Yeah, I, I actually want to finish because you mentioned to me when we had a little chat before that you used to sing as a little boy in a choir. And uh, I, what I try to do is to sing with a cello. Ah. And uh, the first piece that influenced me to become a musician is hearing my mother singing a song to us. It's an it's a Israeli song. It's called Eli, Eli, Oh mm -hmm. God, Oh God. It's a song that sort of became a, a national anthem in Israel, and I love it so much that I've arranged it for cello and piano and recorded it on my CD, The Jewish Soul. So I thought it would be nice to finish with what made me start everything.
Emmett Pellet playing live on our show. We're pretty much out of time, but I wanted to find out what you what's on your schedule for the upcoming months. I know that you have the 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 Bach Suites. Be, they're going to be released in February? On February 1st, it will be released, officially released. On what label? On CTM Classics, mm-hmm. which stands for Catch the Moment. And uh, it's already available on Amazon for pre-order, but it's February 1st, yeah. And then you'll be touring, I'm assuming, and when you're not teaching. How far in advance uh, are you committed to? Well, about a year and a half in advance. I know exactly what I'm doing uh, by the minute, <laughs> 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 including teaching, family time, uh, traveling, playing, uh, so the, the upcoming thing next week, uh, I'm going to Florida with the Peabody Pellet Cello Gang, with six of my Peabody students. You and recorded uh, with them as well? We recorded a CD um, of uh, pieces for cello ensemble. And we're going, it's very interesting, we're going to spend a whole week in Florida playing for uh, underprivileged uh, schools, for kids that are not able to hear classical music uh, in some prisons as well, uh, hospitals. We're going to do a week of that and then uh, literally three, four, or even five schools a day. And we have a big 15 uh, people van that we put the seven cellos and the seven of us. And we're going to go between all the schools. And then we end up the tour with two big sort of official concerts in, in West Palm Beach. Some years ago, I uh, was interviewing a famous jazz musician from who grew up in California in at a time when so many of the the musicians of the day came out of that school system and he said uh, th- th- they might have done something else if they hadn't been uh, offered of that Charlie Mingus, Dexter Gordon, people like that. Uh, uh, today we don't have that in our schools. I know, and that's, that's a shame. And Why that's, do you think I, that is? Money. Money goes to you know building walls and stuff like this. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for the <laughs> political comment. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I really tried hard <laughs> not to mention it. But money, it's all about money. Culture um, is uh, important. You know, like Churchill said, why do we need to go and fight if we don't fight for art? You know, we need a reason, and that's a good reason, and I, I totally agree with it. So I, at least in my humble two cents, I'm trying to do my best by... Uh, publishing a children's book, reading it, playing the cello with the book for kids. A cello uh, named Pablo. Yeah. Um, and trying to play wherever I go to uh, to stop in a school, to stop in a in a place where, you know, old people are home, where people are not able to go out anymore and, and to play for them and to talk to them. And when you are talking to young people, do you find, uh, do a number of them come up to you and say, you know, I just am so moved, I want to learn how to play cello? I'll, I'll tell you this, and that, that could be a good end. Every time when I play for kids, I have one question I always ask them at the end. Who wants to play cello? And if I have 50 kids in the room, 50 of them raise their hands. Wow. If I have 100, it would be 100. If it's 1,000, which happened once, all of them shouting and raising their hand. Now, the problem is that they go home <laughs> and they tell their parents, oh, I need to take them to lessons. It's going to cost money. It's going to be hard. But the excitement for the kids, 100%. And that brings us to the end of today's show. My great thanks to Hemet Pellet, to Charlie Morrow, who composed our theme music, to my executive producer, Jesse Lent, who was at the audio controls, and special thanks to Kevin O'Donohue, Nasima, and Alex Lopez of the Positive Mind Center for making their first-rate studio facilities available to us today. Modern Lopez and Large come to you on Saturdays at 4 and Tuesdays at noon. You can subscribe to Leonard Lopate at Large Podcasts on iTunes and by clicking on Robin Hood Radio's archive program site, which is robinhoodradio.com. You can also check out Leonard Lopate at Large Facebook page. We hope to see you next week.